Okay, it is wonderful to be here and welcome all of you, unfortunately not to sunny San Diego, um, but we're still delighted to have you here. Um, many new faces and many uh, very familiar faces, and it's just so wonderful to be here with all of you. I am not going to speak very long because we wanted to get things started with a bang, and we wanted to start by introducing an incredible Ashoka Fellow who uh, will be doing a few icebreaker activities, but also sharing some of his story. And we wanted to start with um, some of the wonderful energy that only an Ashoka Fellow and a social entrepreneur can bring to put us on the, the right path uh, before we really kick it off the rest of today and over the next few days. So, Eric Dawson, if you can please join us. Uh, Eric is a fantastic Ashoka Fellow and social entrepreneur. He is one of the Empathy Fellows, um, and he'll be sharing a little bit more about what he's been up to. Yep. I am mic'd. Um, how are folks doing? Yeah, that wasn't convincing. Um, let's try this. Good evening. Can folks in the back see me? If you can't see me, I look a lot like Brad Pitt. Just a little shorter. Um, I'm actually not going to do a lot of icebreakers, so don't worry. I heard the collective groan when icebreakers were mentioned. Um, but I do want to just quickly see who's here in the room. So what I'm going to do is just raise your hand and raise it high and proud. Uh, if, if what I say um, connects with you. So raise your hand if you are an undergraduate. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you are a graduate student. Nice. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if you're a faculty member of a university or college. Nice. Notice how slow they all raise their hands? It's that second glass of wine. Uh, raise your hand if you're a staff member at a university. Nice. Um, raise your hand if you consider yourself a social entrepreneur. It's like a 12-step program. <laughs> My name is Eric and I'm a social entrepreneur. Um, raise your hand if you're a Gemini. Watch out for these people. I have a six-year-old who's a Gemini and she is crazy. I told her I was giving a big speech to a lot of people. Her name is Sochi. And I said, Sochi, what, what, should I, what should I talk about? And she goes, pretzels. <laughs> Daddy, everybody loves pretzels. So in her honor, raise your hand if you love pretzels. OK, she'll be happy to know that. OK, hands down. Raise your hand if this is your first Ashoka U gathering. Nice, welcome. OK, hands down. Raise your hand if this is your second Ashoka U gathering. Okay. okay, hands down. Raise your hand if this is your third Ashoka U gathering. Nice. Okay, hands down. Any fourth timers? Wow. Wait, four, fourth timers, ra raise your hands high. We, we have some experts and some veterans. Okay, hands down. Raise your hand if there's a, a young person in your life who's important to you. Maybe a child of your own, a grandchild, a student you work with. Okay. Hands down. Raise your hand if there's a, a spiritual or a faith community that's important to you. OK, hands down. Uh, raise your hand if you're single. OK, look around. I, I, I will point out for those in the back, there's some ladies over here whose hands are kind of half up. You haven't quite decided yet? Could be watching you. That's the thing my daughter does. She, she, my daughter literally walked by my bedroom the other day. I was laying on my bed and she goes like this. <laughs> and then kept walking. Um, I, I can't tell you what, what an honor it is to be here. And um, there, there are two big things I want to do, and I have a very limited amount of time to do this. Um, so I'm going to ask you to take a deep breath, exhale and go along with me on this ride. Um, I'm here because I was a really, really pissy kid. I had um, 
my own experience as a young person is feeling unsafe. I don't know if any of you had that experience as a young person of feeling unsafe, but I, I was an unsafe young person. And my experience with young people who don't feel safe is we tend to do one of three things. Uh, we hurt other people because we're angry and we want some twisted sense of justice. We hurt ourselves through poor decision-making, substance abuse, unprotected sex, suicide. And some of us become lucky and we become organizers. Right? We channel this anger that we feel and we want to change the world. That's the kid I was. So I started Peace First in my organization when I was 18. So uh, this has been my work for 20 years. And, and really, I still technically have my freshman year work study job. <laughs> it's a lot of fun at college reunions. Um, <laughs> and so outside of a brief stint at Burger King, this, this has been my life's work. And I started Peace First for two big reasons. The first I mentioned, which is I was angry, and I was looking for some form of redemption. Um, the other is that we have a crisis in this country. And it is a crisis of hope. Right? We tend to think of hope as sort of airy and, and not substantive. But if any of you have experienced for yourself or met a young person who doesn't have hope, it is, as Paulo Freire said, suicidal. Right? Young people in this country experience a tremendous amount of violence. Right? The violence that we can see and touch that makes the news, like Newtown, and then the quieter issues the desperate issues of young people who feel powerless. And the problem is that in this country, we tend to look at young people as one of two things. They are victims or potential victims that we need to protect, or they're perpetrators that we need to punish, right? So we incarcerate young people, we medicate young people, we turn our schools into prisons, either literally with metal detectors and police officers or spiritually with zero tolerance policies. And so our big idea is what would it look like if instead of looking at young people as victims or perpetrators, we understood them as problem solvers, right? What would it look like to unleash young people's moral imaginations? What would it look like if instead of talking about young people as the future, how many of you have heard that speech? You all are the future. Bugs the shit out of me. <laughs> Excuse my language. Because you are not the future, you're the present. Right? It's incredibly patronizing to talk about young people as being the future. And so what Peace First does is we train young people to be peacemakers. That the same way that kids, we start in preschool and go through eighth grade, the same way that, that kids get reading and writing, they get peacemaking curriculum as part of their school day for 10 years, from preschool through eighth grade. The first half of the year, they learn big skills, cooperation, communication, conflict resolution. The second half of the year, they have to be social entrepreneurs. They have to go out in their communities and solve problems. So we have kindergartners who start recycling programs. We have first graders who write joke books for children waiting in children's hospitals. We had a, a group of third graders who were being bullied by the eighth graders in their school, and their idea was to create a yoga program for the eighth graders. <laughs> These eight-year-olds had no idea what yoga was. But they did research about the health benefits of yoga, did a presentation to their teacher, and got volunteer yoga teachers to do lessons for their students every week. We had a group of eighth graders who thought their teachers were sexist. Basically, their, their issue was the teachers would ask the boys to move boxes and desks, but never the girls. And if you know anything about 14-year-old girls, they're four times the size of 14-year-old <laughs> boys. And they thought this fundamentally wasn't fair. Right? So that's been my business for 20 years, is unleashing young people's moral imaginations. And one of the reasons I wanted to be here tonight is to make a big announcement, because we're getting ready to launch a huge project that we just kicked off a couple weeks ago, which is basically creating a Nobel Peace Prize for young people. Right? So we want to take this concept of peacemaking, which is positive. Right? Who doesn't like peace? But it's soft. Right? It's holding hands and singing songs, it's inner peace, it's kumbaya, or it's esoteric. Right? It's Dr. King, it's Mother Teresa, it's not us. Right? What we want to do is create an understanding of peacemaking that's muscular and accessible. Right? So that when you all have kids someday, the first thing you ask your kids is, how are you a peacemaker today? And they're thinking about, what did I do in my lunchroom? So we're doing a national search for young people between the ages of 8 and 22. Raise your hand if you fit into that group or you know someone who does. 
No one here knows someone between the ages of 8 and 22. Raise your hands. <laughs> Look at this crowd. And we're looking for young people who've done three things. Who've shown compassion, so who've crossed lines of difference to connect with other people. Courage, they've taken personal risks and shown perseverance. And collaborative change, so they've mobilized other people. So we're not looking for the young person who raises a million dollars for schools in Haiti or who runs into a burning building to save a family. Great things. We want that young person who brings together rival gangs in her community. Right? We want that young person whose best friend gets beat up and starts a gay straight alliance to change the culture of his campus. Those delicate, transformative, courageous acts of peace. And then we want to tell the stories. So 10 of these young people receive a two-year $50,000 fellowship to support their peacemaking work, right? So it's not a one day, get your picture taken with the president. This is deep transformative investment in your work, right? So I want all of you to go out, tweet about it, nominate young people, nominate yourselves. It's really easy, it's two questions, because we want to build a movement, right? I grew up in the just say no generation, right? Where Nancy Reagan went on different strokes and told Arnold not to use drugs. And then they had the frying pan and the egg, and wait, the egg was your brain. I never got it exactly. One of them was drugs. Anyways, drugs were bad, right? And now we've got this zero tolerance, don't be a bully, don't be a mean kid. And the problem, the problem, my friends, is that we don't call our young people to anything. We don't, right? And then we're shocked the young people don't show up. So the idea behind the prize is to call young people to something great. And we're doing this with 4-H and City Year and Teach for America and Campus Compact. We've got 1,200 colleges and universities, a cast of Modern Family and Parks and Recreation and Saturday Night Live, which is great, but we need you all to go out and spread the word. So that, that is my challenge for you, um, to get involved. Also, our, our curriculum's all online. So if any of you work with young people, Download it, it's free, use it. The other thing I wanted to share, and this is the last piece I want to do before I introduce the next speaker, um, is share three big ideas um, that I'm wrestling with right now as a leader. And, and I offer this as, as food for thought for this conference. The, the, first, the first big idea is that social change is messy. Right, we think we want to go out and change the world, like, it's, it's like those, those biopic movies, right, where, you know, the hero struggles and they get inspired, then they go out and they have a win, oh, then something bad happens, and then they go out and the world has changed, right? But that's not how it happens, right? It's messy, it's complicated. I was, so I, I teach kids how to be peacemakers, and I was in one of our schools, and a, a parent came up to me, Annie, and she was so excited um, about something that happened with her daughter, and she said, Eric, you'll never guess what happened. Tell me what happened. Um, and her daughter, Susie, has a learning disability, so she's a real hard time expressing language. She said every time when Susie gets angry at home, she starts wailing on her brother. Causes some friction. She said, Eric, for the first time when Susie's brother was bothering her, she looked at him and she goes, I'm really mad at you. Then she started wailing at him. <laughs> right, but it was the fact that that step had been put into her process. This young girl who has such a hard time verbalizing how she feels was able to express herself. And that is what social change looks like. Right? The second big idea is that we have to be able to connect the violence and injustice that we can see and touch with the underlying issues of power and oppression. Right? So if we're going to have a conversation about gang violence, which is something I care a lot about, then we have to talk about young people and jobs. Right, and why 50% of young people in my neighborhood in Dorchester and Boston can't get jobs in the summertime. Right, if we're going to talk about teen pregnancy as a problem, then we have to talk about sexism and messages that young girls get about their worth. Right, if we're going to talk about teen suicide, then we have to talk about homophobia. Right, and those underlying issues that cause our gay, straight, bisexual brothers and sisters to kill themselves at four times the rate as straight youth. When I was in college, the big divide in the service organization was between students who did direct service and students who did advocacy, right? So students who did direct service said, we're doing the real work. And students who did advocacy is like, you're not changing systems, right? And the bottom line is we have to do both. 
And not just we have to do both, is we have to connect that work. So as you think about your work, think about those connections. Think about those underlying issues and do that weaving. The third point and, and final point that I want to make, and, and this is a, an idea that I'm struggling with. Uh, does anyone here give stuff up for Lent? Show of hands. So uh, what I gave, I gave up popcorn, which is my favorite food. Um, and I also gave up saying I told you so. I'll let you guess which one has been more difficult. So I want to invite us all to practice this idea of radical humility. So I always understood humility as lowering myself. I've now begun to think of humility as being open to the possibility that I might be wrong. And it's really interesting to go through life thinking, I actually might be wrong about that. Huh, I might be wrong about that. This idea that as great and wonderful as we are, we stand on the shoulders of people who come before us and we pave a way for folks who come next. The challenge is when we think about something, when we think about movements, when we think about the civil rights movement, we tend to think about moments and individuals, right? We think about Selma, we think about Dr. King. When in fact the civil rights movement was also thousands and thousands of people, mostly women, sitting around kitchen tables and church pews deciding they weren't going to ride a bus or they were going to register to vote. And so the history of social change in our country, in the world, is a history of those small acts that join together into powerful movements. Leaders matter. Events and moments matter. But nothing matters more than those collective actions that we do together. So this invitation to think about our work as with humility, which again isn't debasing ourselves, saying I'm not worth it, I don't know what I'm doing, my work doesn't matter. But in fact to say I'm actually just part of a much larger story. I'm a simple piece of thread in a much larger tapestry. And it's an honor to be part of it. So those are my messages for you. I've got one last challenge I want to give you for your time here today. You ready? You ready? Yes. You ready? Yeah. So the first thing is to take a risk while you're here. And a risk may be that you're the person who's always the last one to speak in a meeting. Be the first one to talk. Put an idea out there. Or maybe you're like me, you're always the first person to speak. <laughs> take a break. Listen. I will sometimes count to 100 in my head before I talk in a meeting. Be like, one, two, three. <laughs> if you're painfully shy, go up and say hi to someone. If you're life of the party, sit back. Because it's only through dissonance, through discomfort that we grow. Right, so take a risk, number one. The second thing is when you meet someone tonight, try this, before you Ask what they do or where they're from. Try asking how they're doing. How are you doing? And then when they say, I'm great, say, how are you really doing? <laughs> I'm not calling you a liar. I just want you to know that I really want to know. The Quakers used to have this greeting for one another where they would say, how goes it with thy spirit? So I want to invite us to create that kind of community here for this weekend. So when you see each other, say, how goes it with thy spirit? <laughs> or what's up, or, you know, <laughs> whatever vernacular you choose. And the last thing I want to say, and, and, and then I'll be done here, is, is have fun. I mean, come on. We're not canning fish 12 hours a day, right? We represent. 0.0001% of the world's population who gets to choose what they do with their time in the way that we get to choose what we do with our time. Have fun with it. Laugh, meet new people, try new ideas. And remember that being here is a privilege. Frederick Douglass wrote that in the struggle for justice, the only reward is to be in the struggle. Right? That's what we're in, right? We're in the struggle. Let's have fun with it. <coughs> Tell some knock-knock jokes. <laughs> One 
What did the ocean say to the boat? Nothing, just waved. <laughs> um, so thank you, thank you for having me. Um, thank you for the time. Please, peacefirst.org backslash prize. Check it out, spread the word. We want to tell thousands and thousands and thousands of incredible stories of young people. And I cannot do that without your help. Um, so thank you. So I, I want to quickly introduce my next speaker. Um, Henry is a synchronized swimmer. No, he's not, just kidding. He's not, but uh, he could be. Um, he's a man who could do anything. Um, Henry is a senior leader at Ashoka, um, the organization that is bringing us all together, um, that invested in me when I was a younger person with a big idea. Um, he's going to talk a little bit about Ashoka's work and uh, have another challenge for you. Hi, folks. Um, so. Welcome on behalf of Ashoka, Ashoka U. I'm very happy myself to be here, and, I, and I've been asked to talk a little bit about, very quickly, about uh, what it means to be a change maker, why we need more change makers. And uh, that's, a, that's, a tough, <laughs> that's a tough one, right? Uh, I come at this a little bit, I'm going to tell a little, quickly a little bit of a story to help you maybe try to understand it rather than try to define it. Um, I understand leadership. Uh, through the lens, I guess I'm a political entrepreneur of sorts, maybe that's some kind of a social entrepreneur, but I was the 2008 COO at Obama for America. Uh, and I came to the campaign in the very earliest days, uh, in 2000, very early 2007. Uh, and that's, I think uh, I had been very much, I understood leadership through the lens of the political campaign. Uh, and that is basically how I've come to really understand change making too, uh, in my own way. Uh, but just to sort of take you through the leadership piece of this just for a second, uh, I do a talk often that I call uh, uh, Hope and Change to Change Making uh, because it really does describe my own experience in terms of uh, uh, understanding this journey a little bit and why change making is so important, not necessarily in the Obama context. But I come at this through the lens also as a CEO, somebody who ran a large organization, somebody who's a dad. I have, a, like Eric, I have two little boys. I, have, I have actually have two, myself two little boys, a, a three-year-old and a five-year-old. Uh, and as an uncle and as somebody who cares about the world. Uh, and um, and I, I like to say that everything I know about the physics of winning and success I learned from the campaign trail. Uh, you know, you always have a winner and a loser. You always see... Uh, it's very entrepreneurial, just like in the business environment, and you always have a sense of the difference between those who, the successful and the aspiring, and so there's le lessons there. It's also very transparent. There's always a camera on the candidate, uh, on your organization, in fact, because everybody's watching everything that you do. Your books are open for everyone to see, right? It's very, uh, you know, uh, every dime you spend is, shows up in the public filings that, you've, that, uh, that uh, are published with the uh, Federal Elections Commission on a regular basis. And if you think about it, it's really pretty remarkable. It's in, this, uh, it's in this hothouse environment that leadership is on display for everyone to see. Imagine coming to work to a place where everything your boss says, every decision that you make, every action that your organization takes, is there for everyone to watch and talk about and analyze. You're the buzz on the internet on Friday, you're the headlines on Saturday, you're the talk of the morning shows on Sunday, and on Monday, uh, you know, you're the water cooler conversation at work. And so uh, I have one story I want to tell you that sort of helps drive home this idea about how I sort of think about change makers and then uh, how I think about the world more broadly and then, um, and then quickly what we're doing at Ashoka around this. Um, I just, just, just so you sort of get a flavor of this, imagine uh, coming to work in the very earliest days where you don't know anybody. Um, there's no signage on the walls. You've just got your new headquarters. Um, you don't have computers. Desks are empty. You have very ambitious people, uh, competitive. You have space that you want, you, want, uh, you, know, you want to get. You want to get resources. You want to get noticed. Uh, and it's in this environment that people come together uh, and it can, it can become very chaotic 
and tumultuous very fast. It's from these seeds of, ca of chaos that most campaigns grow. And so how do you get control of this organization? How you do that actually makes a difference in what happens later. If you don't get control of this environment, uh, you will grow up in disarray, frankly, and you see campaigns sort of uh, stumble a little bit later on as they go. You don't notice it right away. It shows up in the headlines later. And you know, the elbows are sharp. Not everybody is playing nice when you come in the door. Uh, and frankly, uh, it's hard to get your own way in an environment where there are no rules, no boundaries, you don't have cultural history, you don't have norms, you don't even have an employee manual, you don't have a grievance system. And so in that environment, you can lose your leadership fast because, you know, we can all let go of our inner jerks pretty quickly. And uh, we all have one, let's admit it, right? And so uh, it was in this environment that I came into. And so how did we get control of this, right? There was actually something that happened that helped us. And it was three things that came down from the candidate. Three principles. One, you've heard, no drama. Two, build it from the bottom up. And three, respect everyone. And that gave us a culture. That immediately gave us a culture that we had to work within. We had to be collaborative. We had to be, uh, we had to be respectful of each other. Uh, and and uh, it's true we grew up in silos. When you're growing up fast, you do grow up in silos. But I will tell you that those silos come, came down pretty quickly in our case. Uh, we had technology pretty much flatten our organization. We had a lot of changes that we had to go through. We went through everything from, you know, uh, uh, you know obviously a very exciting battle with uh, Hillary Clinton. We had uh, the Reverend Wright crisis, which basically caused a stock market crash at some point. Fundraising stopped. We had layoffs, just like an organization had. We rehired people. We had everything, but things were happening so fast and coming at you so fast. And there's, I was asked later in the campaign, close to October, November, by somebody who said, uh, David Gergen, who was, who's, who, who's a professor of mine at, at Harvard, but he's been in four administrations, and he's been on CNN, obviously, quite regularly. And he said, what was the secret to your success? And some people might say, well, it was social media. It was uh, a gifted candidate, um, you know, young people, the enthusiasm of young people. But my answer was, it was because we had a type of person. And this is the thing that I think a lot of people, the, the television cameras don't pick up. But from that culture of no drama, respect everyone, build it from the bottom up, we were also given a profile of the type of person we should hire. Not necessarily people with long campaign resumes. Not necessarily people with hard political skills. We were actually looking for a type of person who could be collaborative, uh, who could uh, think on their toes, who could command their leadership in their space. And in that sort of environment, as we moved from silos and we broke down and we moved into sort of a more flat organization and we were, we were fielding things fast, things were coming at us fast all the time. It's not what do you do in a crisis, it's actually, actually deciding if you have a crisis. Right? And so uh, there were opportunities that we had to seize, problems we had to solve, and every single problem had a different set of players around it. We didn't solve problems by department. We solved them by teams. We figured out who needed to be at the table. We solved the problem. We saw opportunities come up. We figured out who needed to be t at the table. We, solved the pro uh, we seized the opportunity. And in that environment, you didn't have sort of a structured, uh, uh, hierarchical, uh, system, what you had was a fluid team of teams environment. Now, why do I tell you this? A couple lessons that come out of this about my understanding about change makers. What I said to my friend, Mr. Gergen, was I explained this to him. I said, What we had in the end was somebody, everybody who worked with me had, I had confidence that they had an innovative mind, a service heart an entrepreneurial spirit, and a collaborative outlook. He said, oh, you hired leaders. And I said, I only hired leaders. If I didn't hire a leader in a position, I actually, it was a wasted hire. And the truth was, that was actually counter to what people think of leadership. They still, even still today, people think of one leader at a time. Somebody points the way, we all charge forward. But in this environment that we had, this fluid environment, no rules, people had to be very collaborative, uh, entrepreneurial. What we really had was a different kind of space that we were working in and a different set of rules. 
And I would just argue that this is the kind of world that many of you are graduating into. The world is breaking down. We're coming out of our silos. Everybody has a stake in everything together. We have a stake in our schools together. We have a stake in our, in our young children together. We have a stake in our businesses together. We can't really count anymore on silos to sort of take care of these. The principal doesn't take care of our kids anymore. We all do, right? And as we have a stake in that together, that means we all have to be change makers. We, this new leadership matters now. And we really do have to prepare our young people to step into their leadership in a way that we haven't before. And we have to look at it in a way that we haven't before. And to Eric's point, we have to think differently about how we're bringing our children up into this world through school, through high school, through uh, hopefully through university or whatever it is they go to do. But what we want them to do is they need to step into their bigness. This is a big world. Problems are piling up. Things are going to be coming at us faster and faster. Opportunities are going to come at us faster and faster. We will miss them if we're not able to structure into a more fluid society and command our space as change makers. And that's sort of what we're doing now uh, uh, here today, over the weekend, hopefully we're thinking about people stepping into their bigness, which calls on, by the way, us to be in our biggest places. Sometimes we don't give our own selves permission to be big. And it's a challenge because, for example, we can't have school, pe school teachers trying to make our children small, you know, small people trying to make our, our school children big. We can't have that. We can't have uh, uh, we can't, the physics are, everybody's got to be in their biggest place to do big things. Everybody, not just some of us, all of us. And so we have a responsibility together as change makers, right, to bring each other up, solve problems, seize the world. And we are building, I, I see you, Marina, and so I'll just wrap this up. We are building a movement now. It's starting in this room. It started in this room, but we have it happening now on every continent where we have school teachers teaching children to master empathy so they can be change makers and collaborators, uh, teachers helping uh, uh, secondary school uh, students uh, be collaborative, practice the skills of change making. And we have folks at universities, in business, people like me who get this, hiring change makers is going to be the commodity of the future, the valued commodity of the future. And so, uh, so we're going to talk a little bit more over the weekend about this. Um, I, I, I'll stop now. I'm just, I'll have one challenge that I would also put to everybody. Find, think within yourself, what is the thing, the small voice or the big voice, that's stopping you from stepping into your bigness? Because we need everybody this weekend to be in their biggest place so that we can get a lot done together. Thanks very much, folks. <laughs> Let's see. Good evening. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, I am Bita. I think you have all heard from me at some point or another over the last few days. It is a true pleasure to see each and every one of you. Um, I just have a few quick announcements, but I first want to begin by just thanking all of you. This would not be possible without each and every one of you, the exchange community, our colleagues, our advisors, our sponsors, and our partners. So a huge thank you. Notice during Eric's talk, there is quite a few new faces in the room. There are 600 of you that will be here over the weekend. Um, so if you take a look at your name badge, um, they are color coded. If you have a tan name badge, um, you ha it means you've attended an exchange before. If yours is blue, you are new to the community. So I'd like to take a moment and ask all of the tan badges to if you see somebody with a blue badge, please welcome them, please encourage them. Give them some tips. <laughs> <laughs> to your neighbor, thank you. <laughs> 